Um, okay. Mirarivos, 1832. Uh, let's again, a little background. Uh, 1789, the first French Revolution, because there are serious, the great French Revolution. French Catholics will say that it wasn't really the French Revolution. It was French, all right. Uh, but they say, you know, the so-called French Revolution, or the, the supposed French. I mean, French Catholics, you know, they're patriots like everybody else, so uh, they don't like the idea of sort of associating, but, but it was very French, led off by Voltaire and Rousseau, and it was, a, for the, it, it, was, it was the outbreak of corruption. The corruption was all there, it was just waiting to burst out at some moment, and it burst out in the French Revolution, and a lot of priests were killed, and a lot of sisters were killed, and the king was killed, and a lot of aristocrats were killed. The old regime, as it was called, the ancien regime, was just not doing its, its Catholic job. Had they, had, when you've got aristocrats who are real Catholics, and kings who are real Catholics, the people are happy, and they don't make revolutions. Because if they are really Catholic, they are honest, they look after the people, they do their duty, they're paternal in the right kind of way. The people don't make a revolution. When the people make a revolution is when the leaders are not doing their Catholic job. Then the people say, hey, you guys don't deserve to be on top. You're, you're betraying us, you're taking our women, you're taking our money, you're not giving us any leadership. Forget it, get lost. And uh, you know, then they set up a guillotine and cut all their heads off. Uh, it, but the, if you study the events, the revolution was satanic. There's a very good book by an American historian, American <coughs> Warren Carroll, on the French Revolution. It's very good. Uh, it may be in the, in the library, I can't remember. And he tells the, the revolution from a Catholic point of view, a thoroughly Catholic point of view. It's quite different from how you normally read about the French Revolution in the secular history books, which is, which is delinquent, you know. It's the, so again, how you, if, the, if you read the revolution as liberalism sees it, it was a marvelous and wonderful and great moment. If you read the revolution as the Catholics see it, oh boy, it's one big lie. One big lie. For instance, the, the, the capturing of the Bastille, which, which is meant to be the great sort of moment of the French Revolution. When they broke open the Bastille, there were sort of five mangy, worm-eaten prisoners sort of crawled out. The, the, the liberating these five mangy was, was meant to be a big deal. It wasn't a big deal at all. You know, but anyway. So the great heroic capture of the Bastille was, was no really big deal as, as they were pretending. However, um, the next revolution was 1830. 1815 was the Battle of Waterloo. Napoleon was defeated. Napoleon was the sort of spin-off of the revolution. 1815, the Battle of Waterloo. Uh, that was kind, and then the Restoration. 1815, Cross Swords Waterloo. Napo uh, 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 Wellington defeated uh, Bonaparte on a, on a battlefield in Belgium. That was the end of Napoleon Bonaparte. He was exiled to an island, this time right in the middle of the Atlantic where he was poisoned and died in 1821. He was actually poisoned, the English poison, you know, I mean, which is understandable. You know, so. uh, but he didn't die of old age, let's say. Uh, and that, then the restoration, so the French monarchy was restored, but the monarchy was no longer the same. And uh, you know, the, 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 the liberal poison, uh, the anti-Catholic poison had really burst out, like a boil bursting, it really burst out with the French Revolution. So when the monarchy was restored, from then on, right through the 19th century, you got this, in France, you got this swinging backwards and forwards between a monarchy and liberalism, and, mon and monarchic ideas and the liberal ideas. The restoration, but the restoration comes to the end with the next revolution, which is in, which is in uh, 1830. Revolution in France, and also in Italy. And at the beginning of this encyclical, the Pope mentions a second outburst. So there was a double outburst. And the liberal ideas are strong in France and they're also very strong in Italy. And uh, the, liberal, the liberals don't like Catholicism. The liberals believe in liberty, equality, fraternity. They believe in humanity. They, don't, they believe in man. They don't look so keen on God. You've got the new world order really making 
its way. And so there's a, there's a clash. Um, the clash is not nearly as strong in England because England has been under the devils of liberalism for a lot longer. Uh, the, the clash in England was back much more at the time of the Reformation. And even then there wasn't that much of a clash because there weren't enough really Catholic Englishmen to put up a real fight. There was a fight in England, there were some glorious martyrs. But uh, it was nothing, uh, it wasn't enough of a fight. And so England went Protestant and it just wallowed in Protestantism and liberalism from then onwards. So about this time, the, uh, there's not much of a fight in England, but in France, the, 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 where there's Catholicism had been strong, it took a lot of the Masons had to work hard, and the Masons and Liberals had to work hard right through the 19th century in order to try to stamp out Catholicism. So uh, there was a revolution. Then in 1848, there was another big revolution, not only in France and in Italy, uh, but also in other countries of Europe, always Freemasonry. It was uh, Freemasonry behind all of them. Uh, the Freemasons are the shock troops of liberalism. And it's the Freemasons that are responsible for these revolutions. So, uh, interestingly, the English are on the side of the angels. Uh, the, you know, the English fought the Napoleon and they, they received, the time of the French Revolution, you have the famous uh, reflections by Edmund Burke on the French Revolution. The, the Anglo-Irish statesman Edmund Burke, famous and he, he doesn't like the revolution, and he's right. But do you know why Edmund Burke doesn't like the revolution? There's a famous passage, he talks about Queen Marie Antoinette, and he says, oh, this gracious queen, how lovely she was, and uh, uh, you know, she represented everything that was so noble and beautiful for so many centuries in Europe, and here the poor gal goes to the guillotine and gets her head cut off. Can you rebuild Europe on that? No, you can't. The gracious queen who looked so nice and, and carried herself so well and, and represented everything that was most feminine and, and honorable in, in centuries. You, you can't rebuild on that. And so Edmund Burke is not the answer because Edmund Burke was not Catholic. It's Catholicism or nothing. And if, if the Lord God is allowing these great problems to shake Western civilization to pieces. He's allowing it in order that Westerners will go back to God and will go back to the Catholic Church. <coughs> that's, the, that's the only reason God has for allowing these disasters that people, in order to make people save their souls. And today in the United States, the whole thing is falling to pieces because God is saying, God is allowing it all to fall to pieces. And at any moment now, Wall Street falls to pieces. And when, when Wall Street falls to pieces and all of these millions of in poor investors that have been sucked into mutual funds, when they all, their, all their savings, their life savings, disappear overnight, they will at least be asking themselves questions. At least. Who can I go and shoot? Maybe the only question that they will ask. Or maybe a few of them will say, is there something wrong with the system? Maybe I shouldn't have been worshipping money after all. Maybe money isn't God. A few will make. That's why God... The anger is coiled up in people, says a friend of mine today. That people are all ready to tear one another to pieces. And this, when the money dries up, when the money goes fuck, when the money goes down the tubes, then the anger is going to break out. And how many people will turn back to God at that point? That's the question. That's what it's all for. So the big bad modern world has got a meaning, and it does, it does make sense. But uh, it's not senseless what God is allowing to happen. But are men going to make the right use of it? That's a completely different question. So uh, what 1832, this encyclical comes in uh, at this stage, obviously. 1832, Mirari votes. And what has happened is that there is a French priest who, at the time of the Restoration, made himself a name by coming up with a completely new way of defending Catholicism. Um, Felicité de Lamennais was his name. Father Felicité de Lamennais. He was a very brilliant man. I think it's one M and two M's. 
very brilliant. And he, he was a romantic. He had a romantic temperament. In other words, by temperament, he sort of belonged to the revolution. But by his faith, he did have the faith. He did also belong to Catholicism. So Lamennais uh, came, wrote this book, which appeared about 18, 28, 29, 30, around this time. Or he was issuing this, he was running this uh, magazine called Athenaeum, The Future. And he was proposing uh, a new a compromise of the church and, and the new ideas of the revolution. And he was then the first uh, liberal Catholic. He's the first and most famous liberal Catholic. In other words, a, a Catholic who tries to combine the defense of the faith with the defense of liberty. He's trying to mix together liberty and Christ the King. He's trying to combine the two. Now, if you can do it, if you can do it, it's going to be a great seller. Uh, it'll sell like hot cakes. Uh, because, uh, you know, and it's exactly what John Paul II is trying to do. He's trying to mix together the world and the, and the church. He's trying to be traditional on one hand, and at the same time, he's against abortion, he's against divorce, he's against women's priests. In morals, he's traditional. But then in dogma, he's all for all of these other religions and being kind to Luther. He's just been in Germany praising Luther. So he's, he's trying to mix. And it's, it's a very popular product. I mean, John Paul II is loved by the media everywhere, and the people, the great crowds, and he's sort of loved because he goes everywhere telling everybody that they're all wonderful. And you know, that's one way of making yourself popular, to go everywhere and tell everybody that they're wonderful. Uh, and tell them with, you know, big words and lovely language so that you sound a bit convincing. I mean, everybody likes being told that they're wonderful after all. So, so Lamine was saying, look, Catholicism is wonderful and the new world of the revolution is wonderful. But hey, the two are against one another. Ah, but you see, with religious liberty, you can allow this, uh, you can get the two together because religious liberty means liberty for religion. That's, that's the combination. Religious liberty. Great. Hey, we solved the problem. So, this is the beginning, Lamine is the beginning of uh, religious liberty. But the, the old, crusty old bachelor in Rome who dressed in white, mm, Gregory the 16th, oh, the Pope, oh, he didn't seem to like it so much. So Lamine went down to Rome to see the old Pope, to see, that if, to see if he couldn't uh, win him over. This was in, I think, the end of 1831 or the beginning of 1832, to see if he couldn't sort of get approval for his brilliant new ideas of the future, L'Avenir. See, so he saw the Pope, and the, Pope's, the Pope sort of welcomed him in and said, ah, uh, oh, nice to see you, Father. Father, how's your mother? Uh, because the Pope must have known Madame de Lamine. How's your mother? So, whoa, 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 my mother's fine. How did you sleep in your Roman hotel? Did you get a good night's, few, have you had a few good night's rest since you've been in Rome? <laughs> uh, Father, would you like me to give you a few rosaries? So he hands him a few rosaries and then sends, sends the brilliant young priest on his way. <laughs> and the brilliant young priest was just boiling to talk all about his wonderful plan to save the church with the, in revolutionary times. And the crusty old bachelor just sends him on his way. So, you know, Lamine went away, and, and then a little while later, there came out this, exactly this encyclical on the Feast of the Assumption in 1832. And in this encyclical, the Pope says exactly what he thinks of Felicity de Lamine. Felicity de Lamine is not named. Because it's not a problem of a person's, it's a problem of ideas. Remember, remember, remember. The, the clashes of ideas are much more important than the clashes of persons. Americans think that the clashes of persons are what matters. Because Americans don't go much on ideas generally, but it's ideas that govern persons. And therefore, the Pope, you know, it's not a question of persons. It's not a question of this Felicity de Lamine. It's a question of his ideas. And the, therefore, the ideas are attacked and not the persons. Take a look at, the, we will go through in this issue with these, these kind of summaries, which give you a swift overview and enable us to move quite fast. But I hope that you've read Mirari Vos, or you've read a good deal of it in the meantime. And I hope you've picked up the dramaticness of the language. Um, you will are well aware by what evils and what calamities we have been assailed from the first moment of our inst of pontificate and how carried away into the midst of the tempest. A miracle of the right hand of the Lord alone spared us the grief of being swallowed up. 
by the sad picture of so many perils, scattering the disloyal, imminent danger, appeasing the fearful tempest, paragraph two, to breathe after so great fear, the wounds of Israel, the enormous weight of care, <gasps> the insolence of the factions, so there was an, at the sight of such stubbornness, unbridled fury, seemed only envenomed by too, in, too long impurity. We had been compelled, soul crushed with grief, arrest them by the rod of severity. Oof. The old man is on a roll. I mean, you know, uh, the old man is, is really upset. That you can tell. So, so this, this priest thought he was going to use, so, so the old man is making a connection in the introduction, paragraphs one to seven. He's connecting the horrors of this, these, these, these revolutions with the ideas of eight to 27. Behind, you know, as the old man is saying, behind the storm, paragraphs one and two, and the rerun storm, the repeat storm of three and four, behind these storms of being commotions in history, you've got these new ideas, and, and, and of course that's it. You've got a new world order of the revolution in a head-on clash with the old world order of Catholicism. And it's, it's a fight which both sides are willing to shed blood for. And it comes to blood again and again and again. It's Satan against Christ. And the new world order is Satan. It's, I say, it's clearer to see in the case of France than it is in the case of America, in the case of the United States. Because the United States was born in Protestantism, and it's, the clash is clearer in France than it is in England. Because in England, the clash was, went further back. But in France, where Catholicism was still strong, that's where the clash was bloodiest and where you can see it most clearly. Italy also to uh, a slightly lesser extent. The calamitous revolution of 1830 prevented us from writing, thanks be to God for deliverance, exclamation mark. A fresh outbreak forced us to resort to severity, but at last on Our Lady's feast day we can write. Now is the hour of darkness. That's, of course, a quotation of our Lord. A lot of this is quotation from Scripture. I don't, in this edition, you aren't given the Scripture references. But a lot is reference to... Uh, you need an edition which quotes the references. Uh, the Pope is again and again picking up expressions from Scripture, the prophet Jeremiah, notably. The hour of darkness is our Lord speaking in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is your hour and the power of darkness. As, as the, the gang closes in on our Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Pope is undoubtedly thinking that the, 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 the robbers and the thugs are closing in on the church, just like they closed in on our Lord. The hour of darkness, of worldwide corruption. Paragraph five, you know, I mean, what would the Pope have said? Ima apply paragraph five to the day. Uh, now is the hour granted to the power of darkness to winnow like rain the children of election. The earth is truly in mourning and wastes away, infected by its inhabitants because they have transgressed the laws, changed justice, and dissipated the eternal alliance. Can you say that of today? Is that, what's, is that a fair description of the modern United States, for instance? Surely. It's, it's not just the modern United States, obviously. Modern France, definitely. Modern England, everywhere. Wherever you like, Canada, wherever you like. Perversity and revolt are tearing apart church and world. Gee whiz. He said that back in 1832. What would he have said today? But could you get a better one-sentence description of, of the modern world? Perversity and revolt are tearing apart church and world. It's exactly 1996. Perversity, science without modesty, unbridled lightness at work, full of ardor and of insolence. The sanctity of the mysteries excites nothing but contempt, which is why we had Vatican II. Get rid of those old mysteries. All of that's trash. Throw away the beautiful vestments. Turn the altars around. Tin cups instead of gold. The majesty of the divine worship has become for perverse men an object of censure, profanation, and sacrilegious derision. That's exactly Vatican II. Sound doctrine has changed. Errors of every kind are broadcast with scandal by the Holy Father himself in the 1990s. The sacred rites, the rites and issues of the church, all that is most holy and disciplined, are any of them safe from the audacity of these tongues of iniquity? People can say what they like and they will be glorified on television if they destroy Catholicism. Uh, Phil Donahue. Our chair at Rome, the see of the blessed Peter, is cruelly persecuted. The bonds of unity are daily more and more enfeebled, violently torn apart. 
The divine authority of the church is attacked. The rights of the church are torn from it. It is subordinated to utterly earthly conviction. The force of injustice, it, de it is devoted to the contempt of na nations, reducing the church to a shameful servitude. Now, the only difference today is that the Pope himself is reducing Mother Church to a shameless servitude. The Pope himself is subordinating Catholicism to the Protestants by glorifying Luther and by welcoming the Jews and by going and saying, Mohammedans, you and we worship the same God. It's the Holy Father himself who's, who's doing it. That's how far, how much further. At this time, the Pope is refusing the corruption. But today, he's one of the main instruments of the corruption. That's he's apologizing everywhere. <laughs> The Holy Father is apologizing everywhere, of course, exactly. It's, it's incredible. The scandal has now got to the very top of the church. Gregory the Sixteenth held the line, and the popes right down to Pius the Twelfth held the line, and they're the ones that wrote the encyclicals that we will look at. But ever since Pius the Twelfth, the popes have, the popes have, instead of resisting the revolution, they've joined the revolution. The old principle, I think it was a real, real Rogers. If you can't lick them, join them, right? And that's what the Catholics say. If you can't lick the Catholic Church, if you can't lick the revolution, you join it. And that's what finally even the churchmen have said. But you can't. You can't join the revolution. It's anti-Catholic. So, uh, paragraph seven, courage, my lords. Remember that he's writing to the bishops always. That's why, my lords, let us lead our flock to safe pastures. So that's the introduction. The, that's where the, the, that's the historical background of revolution that he's writing against. Now he goes from 8 to 27, you obviously have the heart of the encyclical, and he's going into the ideas which are tearing the world apart. The ideas of the revolution and worse, the ideas of a Catholic priest trying to integrate Catholicism into the revolution or integrate revolution into Catholicism won't fly won't fly. So here he, he argues. Now notice, it divides into two sections, 8 to 13 and then 14 to 27. You've got no subheadings in this little edition of yours that you've got, but um, it's divided into two. And notice that the first section, 8 to 13, is the errors in the church, inside the church, and then 14 to 27 is the errors in the world. And it's not an accident that he puts the errors in the church first. Because if you've got Bad doctrine amongst the churchmen, that's much worse than bad doctrine amongst the laity. Because the churchmen are the salt of the earth and the light of the world, and if they are corrupt, then the laity haven't a chance. What do you, what's the expression that they haven't a, they haven't a hope, they haven't a, there's something they haven't, a prayer. they haven't, haven't a prayer. they haven't a prayer, exactly. If the churchmen are all over the place, the laity haven't a prayer, exactly. So he starts with the church. Notice again, he starts with the faith. He doesn't start with charity. He doesn't start with let's all be nice. If only we were all nice to one another, all the problems would go away. Baloney. It's a question of the faith which is in the mind. Let Catholics all clear up their faith and then they will naturally have charity towards one another. Catholics that have the faith have, have got the essence of unity. You could go, all of you, to the Fiji Islands. You'd, you'd run into the bunch of traditional Catholics in the Fiji Islands, and there is a little bunch in the Fiji Islands. You'd immediately understand one another. You'd be better friends within five minutes with the traditional Catholics on the Fiji Islands who you've never met in your life than you are with your neighbor who you've been living 20 years alongside on the block. Because he belongs to a completely different mental, spiritual, and intellectual world. That although you've been living for 20 years side by side, he's in a different world from yours. Whereas the Fiji Island who's got the Catholic faith, he's in your mental world. If you've got the faith, the faith is a tremendous unifier. That's the real unity. But the, today they want unity without the faith, without the truth. It won't fly. So then, then he goes on to church discipline 10, church tradition 11, celibacy 12, and marriage 13. Do they ever today attack celibacy, do I need to ask you, or, or Christian marriage? Let's have a look at eight. Eight and nine is where the action is. That's the, in this encyclical, eight and nine is the uranium in the reactor. And we will see, I don't know how many encyclicals we'll get a chance to see, but you'll see that again and again, it's the principles, it's the ideas that matter more than the love, love, love business. Because the love, love, love 
in any real sense, can only follow from the right ideas. And therefore the popes again and again, they will go like for the jugular, for they will go for the ideas. And when it comes to the ideas, it's the question of the faith. Because the faith is the supernatural truth in our ideas. All right. The Catholic Church, paragraph eight, needs no innovations, not even of words. Notice that one. And that, according to the warning of the Pope, Holy Pope Agatha, nothing that has been regularly defined can bear diminution or change or addition, and it repels every alteration of sense or even of words." Unquote. Notice Gregory XVI is quoting an ancient Pope. Catholicism doesn't change, and it cannot change. He goes, he doesn't say what he thinks, he says what an old Pope from centuries ago thinks. I don't know what century Agatha belonged to, but probably the second or third century. There's only one Agatha, it wasn't three or four or five. Secondly, notice uh, that the Catholic Church needs no innovation. This is bang, the, whole, the old man's answer, the crusty old bachelor's answer to this brilliant young intellectual who's gonna save the church of the modern world, right? The brilliant young man, this is his answer. The brilliant young man came to Rome and I, if only this old man will listen, he will learn from me how to, Convert the modern world and make the whole world Catholic. Father, how's your mother? <laughs> Father, would you like a rosary? Bye-bye. Be a good boy. Be on your way. This is the answer. The Catholic Church needs no innovations. We do not need brilliant young men to turn the church upside down to teach Jesus Christ a lesson. As Archbishop Lefebvre once said, our Lord is neither liberal nor reformed. He doesn't need to be changed, and he doesn't need to be reformed. He is God, and as God, he happens to know, and he's right. And the Catholic Church knows what our Lord says, and the Catholic Church stands by what our Lord says, and the Catholic Church does not need to adapt to the modern world what our Lord says. The revolution is wrong, and our Lord Jesus Christ is right, period. <laughs> The Catholic Church does not need to be updated or to be innovated or to be brought in, in line with the times, not even changes of words. Whereas, of course, Vatican II said, oh, we must, we're not changing dogmas, but we need a pastoral re-expression in order that the same old truths be re-expressed for modern times. Then they change the words, and by changing the words, they completely change the doctrine. In France, they did away with consubstantial in the creed, and they put in of the same nature. It doesn't mean the same thing at all. You and I are of the same nature, but we're certainly not of the same substance. So the French modernists, they changed the creed. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are of not only of the same nature, they're also of one substance. God is of one substance, consubstantial. Not just connatural, but, but going a lot further, consubstantial. So they change, they translate as of one nature, because people no longer understand the word substance. So we need to change the word to words that people will understand. So we've got to get the Catholic faith into television Walt Disney language. How are you going to express the Catholic faith in Walt Disney language? Well, that's what the modernists want to do. Let's get the faith down to the level of the simple people of today, and anything that modern people can't, today can't understand, they don't need to be taught. There's no question of teaching them, of lifting the people up to the doctrine. We've got to pull the doctrine down to the people. And so, you know, we're going to say, what was Jesus Christ? Well, Jesus Christ was, uh. That's about the level that people today understand. You know, he was a, uh. And he was a good guy. Jesus Christ, Jesus was a good guy. That's about the level they bring the faith down to today. It was about the level that people understand. But the principle is not bringing the faith down to the level of the people. The principle of Catholicism is to lift the people up to the level of the faith. Because you've got to lift people to heaven. That's what people are on this earth for. They've got to go to heaven. Second, what's the remedy for this terrible error of this, uh, this itch to innovate and change and, 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 and update? Answer, the answer is the Pope and the deposit and the hierarchy. What the church does need is faithfulness to the See of Peter in order to guard the deposit of faith, because the Pope is the guarantee of the deposit of faith. And when you had a Gregory the 16th, of course it was true. When you had all the way down to and including John the 20, uh, to uh, Pius the 12th, who, who died in 1958, it was true. But from John the 23rd onwards, even the Sea of Peter rocks, is rocking with revolution. Therefore, 
faithfulness to the Sea of Peter in its right mind. You'd have to add today, faithfulness to the Sea of Peter in its right mind. Because it's no longer in its right mind, but of course the Pope is the answer. And this crisis of today is only going to be overcome, not by the little old Society of St. Pius X, chuntering away in the backwoods like we're doing here. That's not gonna, that's not gonna uh, put an end to this crisis. It will simply guard the deposit. It will keep the sacred flame in the backwoods until God saves his Pope. And then when God rescues the Pope, the Pope is then going to say, hey, you there still there in Winona, come here, we need you. Want to get you all over the United States? Want you to, uh, 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 he, the, the Pope will appeal to those that have kept the faith, not only the society, but all those that have kept the faith through these difficult times, the Pope, when he's restored, will appeal to. So, faithfulness of the Sea of Peter in Shrine Mind, in order to guard the deposit of faith. Can you explain the Sea of Peter? Uh, the a sea means a seat, S-E-A-T, oh. a throne or a seat. It's another word for seat. It doesn't mean looking or seeing. It's simply a word for seat. So the seat of Peter means the throne of Peter, the chair of Peter. The, in other words, the, the papal throne. Worry. Yes. Faithfulness to the authority of Peter. That's what it means. Today you need to act, add in brackets as long as he's in his right, as long as Peter is in his right mind, which, which for a few years Peter hasn't been. But because, because why are you faithful to the Sea of Peter? Point two, in order to guard the deposit of faith. In other words, the Pope is for the faith. And the Pope has no right to change the faith. He's only there in order to guard the faith. Therefore, the Pope may not go round and say Luther was a good guy, because Luther was a terrible enemy of the Catholic faith. The Pope can't do that. And if he does do it, he's got no right to be obeyed. And we've got no duty to obey him if he does things like that. We, we regard him as the Pope, we respect him as the Holy Father, but when he talks nonsense, we say, Holy Father, no. When he talks sense, then we say, Holy Father, yes. When he talks nonsense, we say, Holy Father, no. How do you tell whether he talks sense or nonsense? We've got 2,000 years of church history in order to judge. We've had 2,000 years of popes in order to judge the, the modern popes, or as it was 1,950 years of popes, before the, the popes went liberal. The faith is the measure of the popes, and the popes are not the measure of the faith. The popes normally are the instrument for declaring what the faith is. But the popes can't change the faith around, which is what these liberals, recent liberals, uh, Paul VI, John XXIII, Paul VI, John Paul II, that's what they've been trying to do. They can't do it. And how is this done? By a top to bottom subordination of the church hierarchy. And this was the, 19th, the church's 19th century answer. And for the first half of the 20th century, the Catholic church strictly, strictly, strictly obeyed. And as long as the man at the top was good, then as long as the bishops obeyed the Pope, and the priests obeyed the bishops, and the people obeyed the, obeyed the priests, then the whole thing stayed, the whole thing held. But if you were the devil, what would you then try to do? If everybody is being a Catholic simply by obedience, what would you do? You'll go for the man at the top. Because if you can bag the man at the top, the whole thing will drop into your lap. That's exactly what happened with, with Paul VI. Paul VI used all his authority as Pope to smash the conservatives. He used all his authority as Pope. And there was only one bishop who stood up to him and said, Holy Father, no. Who really stood up to him and said, Holy Father, no. And that was Archbishop Lefebvre. All the others said, Holy Father, yes. Holy Father, no. Uh, how high, Father? The Holy Father said, jump, jump into liberalism. And all of the bishops said, how high, Holy Father. And they were very pious when they said it, very obedient when they said it. And the Arch archbishop said, no, you can't tell me to jump into liberalism. I want to die a Catholic. I've got to live and die a Catholic. I've got a soul, I've got a soul to save. If I become a liberal, I won't save my soul. So the bottom, top to bottom subordination of the church hierarchy is good as long as the top is keeping the faith. But if the top isn't keeping the faith, you're in dead trouble. That's why the society says to the laity today, it says, I, you know, we don't generally say to you, did I say this yesterday? We don't say to you, jump, jump, jump. We say to you, look, this is the faith, this is the faith, this is the faith. As long as we teach this faith, listen to us. And here it is, read it yourselves. 
You've got encyclicals in your hands. Read it for yourselves. Read, read, read. I'm not saying listen to me and obey. I'm not saying sit there and, and believe whatever I'm telling you because I've got purple buttons. Well, I would have if I was wearing one of those cassocks. I'm saying no, believe me because here is what, what I'm telling you is what the popes say. What the popes in their right minds say. This is what the church said. That's... That's what the society is saying. The society is not saying, you know, uh, believe, uh, obey us. Just like you obeyed before and now obey us. No, you better obey in a different way. You better obey in a rather more thinking way because we might go crazy. I might go crazy. Something little sweet comes by one day and the poor bishop goes off his mind. Ah, it's happened before. It's happened before, gentlemen. Pray for me, I beg of you. Because... He was you there. <laughs> you know, it's happened before. Oh, brother. So, you know, pray for me. I'm a poor sinner just like you are. So, uh, I'm not saying, uh, follow me, follow me, follow me. I'm saying, like Archbishop Lefebvre, Archbishop Lefebvre didn't say, follow me, follow me, follow me. He said, follow the popes. And the Archbishop said, we need to make more use of the encyclicals. If more Catholics like you, if only were more Catholic men were reading, so when I say to you, between 10 and 11, please, gentlemen, read. I'm not saying, you know, please, gentlemen, don't come back like goldfish. And just drink it all in. Think. Think. Think for yourselves. Which I, you know, do think. So, if that's the eight and nine are the heart and soul of this little encyclical. Well, then we move on immediately to action. From the, from the ideas, we move into action. Firstly, discipline. Church structure and discipline must be respected. That's in order that the hierarchy, uh, that there be obedience and obedience to the faith through the bishops, priests, to the pope. Obedience to the faith. Uh, the pope is a judge of any timely modifications. If there's any updating to be done, the pope must do it. But it's got to be in line with tradition. We want to defend because the errors are against church tradition. 11. The errors 12 and 13, even more practical, the errors are against priestly celibacy. To John Paul II's credit, he has stoutly defended priestly celibacy. And he's, not, he's never going to give way on it. He won't give way on it. But they're just waiting for him to go, and then they will, there'll be another big push for priests to get married. And let all defend marriage's sacramental indissolubility. It's not just celibacy for the priesthood, but also that Catholics marry and marry properly. Marry the one girl and then stay with her until death do them part. That's the Catholic way. And that, that sacramental marriage is a key part of society. Through these encyclicals uh, of, the, of this part, we will see in the 19th century the Pope again and again having to defend Catholic marriage. Catholic marriage is tough. I can't stand them. Boy, I loved it. It lasted three months, and then from then on, was, ah. oh, if only I could get rid of it. But you can't. It's tough. It's tough. But that's our law. It, you may, of course, hit the jackpot. You may have a wonderful gal who you will cry your heart out when she dies. Uh, you know, you can, it, it, marriage is a lot, and you can hit a wonderful girl, but if you hit an absolute so-and-so, you've still got to stay married. That's the Catholic way. But the Masons attack Catholic marriage, because if they can only pull the hus husband and wife apart, if they can pull the family apart, then the kids are all over the place. The kids are sitting ducks, just like today. The kids are terribly vulnerable if their mum and dad don't stay together. You can see that. Every kid whose mum and dad didn't stay together, who hasn't had a mum and dad to bring him up. Every kid, such kid, is wounded. I'm sure, I'm sure you can observe that. It's wounded more or less. Of course, they make their own lives, and God doesn't condemn them for the errors of their parents. But it's, it's a handicap for a kid not to have had his mum and dad hanging together. So the Catholic Church defends marriage indissoluble until death do them part. It's a key point, paragraph 13. He doesn't argue it. Leo XIII will write a whole encyclical about marriage in which he will argue, argue, argue why, why indissoluble marriage is so important. 
Gregory the 16th doesn't argue, he just lays it out. He says, guys, this is what's needed, this is what's needed, this is what's needed, that's what's no good, that's what's no good, that's what's no good. I tell you it's so, believe me, obey me, because I'm in line with tradition. Uh, but he doesn't, but li the, other, the later popes will see, will certainly be reading in circles in which the popes do more argue. <laughs> argue. In the world, liberty, the liberal errors, firstly in the church, against the faith, against discipline, against tradition, against celibacy, against marriage. Now, the liberal errors in the world. And the, the, it, the liberal errors boil down to one word, a misunderstanding of liberty. Liberty of religion, firstly, 14. Liberty of conscience, 15. Liberty of the press, 16 to 20. Liberty from authority, 21 to 26. And then 27, the practitioners of liberty. And that's where Gregory the 16th shows, he, again, he hasn't named them, he had, doesn't name Felicity de Lamy. he doesn't need to, it's the ideas that matter. Again, 27, he doesn't name the Jews and the Freemasons and the communists and all of these various enemies of the church, but he doesn't need to. But he, in 27, he shows that he knows who they are, secret societies, he calls them. These liberties, 27, are fought for, by a host, a whole number of secret societies. The Pope is obviously up to date. He knows about Freemasonry. But, but it's not, it's, it's no use saying, the Freemasons are the bad guys, kill all the Freemasons and the problem will be over. No, it won't be over. If people have got, that was just like knocking off the flower and leaving all the roots. If people have got sin in their hearts, <coughs> then it's no use shooting all the Freemasons. That's not gonna do it. You've gotta get sin out of the hearts. You've got to make people stick with their wives, 13, or stick with their husbands. You've got to make people faithful, and that's the answer. It's tough. It's a lot easier to take out a machine gun and go and shoot a few Freemasons. But that's not what's going to do it. Henry VIII has got to stay with his wife, and for the future of his dynasty, he's got to, tr he's got to trust God as to what will happen to his dynasty. Then, liberty of religion, 14. Religious indifferentism is a pernicious error, damning souls. But you see, from the ideal of religious liberty, which is the ideal of the United States, for instance, the First Amendment, you would say, well, that, yes, but that's only religious liberty in practice. That's not the principle. Ha, 1648 to 1789, the, print, the, the fact slides into the principle all too easily. Religious indifference is a pernicious error. A con the consequent freedom of conscience is the ruination of church and state to allow people to tell people that they are free to take what religion they like, which is exactly what the state does here in the United States, also in France and in England now. But to set up as a principle that people may follow what religion they like is the ruination of church and state. Whereas Lamine will have been saying, hey guys, we can reconcile liberty in the church. All we've got to do is give everybody the liberty to be Catholics. Which means the liberty also to do anything, anything else if they like. Uh, that's, that's not Catholicism. God doesn't give us freedom to be Protestants or Muslims or Buddhists. He allows them to, these, these false religions to exist. But he doesn't say that we've got the right to follow the false religions. He says in the Gospel, he that is be believes and is baptized will be saved. He that refuses to believe will be condemned. That's it. At the end of the Gospel of St. Mark. You, you and I have got to be Catholics if we want to save our souls. Period. The freedom of conscience is the ruination of church and state. You saw what happened to Europe when Europe allowed Protestants and Catholics. It tore Europe apart. And then the, it's, it's not as though you, Protestants and Catholics lived in peace, lived happily from then onwards, because the Protestants were working to destroy Catholicism, and that was the French Revolution. And the French Revolution, the blood flowed, and the blood will flow. You're only going to get people living happily and quietly together, really, when they're all Catholic. Then you will have peace. There have been no major wars in South America for four, 500 years. Why? Because they're all Catholic. A recent example, um, Chile and the Argentine, that this is Chile and that's the Argentine, were arguing about some silly little island. I say silly little island because it didn't seem silly to them. 
but some little piece of territory right down in the south in the Beedon Strait. They nearly went to war. They appealed to Great Britain to arbitrate, and the arbitration was no good. But these two Catholic countries then appealed to the Pope to arbitrate. I think this was about 1980-81. They appealed to the Pope to arbitrate, and the Pope's arbitration both accepted because he's Catholic. He was a Catholic. Uh, so they didn't go to war. So what did the Freemasons then do? The Freemasons stirred up trouble between rotten Protestant England and Argentine, and that was the Falklands War. Uh, the, it would have been best if the Masons had been able to get the Catholics to fight the Catholics, but they failed because there were two Catholics to go to war with one another. They accepted the Catholic Pope's arbitration. So the Masons fell back on the next best, which was to make the Protestants fight the Catholics, which is the old story. So England went down there and got into a punch-up with the Argentine and so on and so on. But if everybody's Catholic, no wars will really get very bloody. A few men, you know, a few boys jump up on horses and <coughs> they charge with lances and a few of them get broken limbs and a few of them even get killed. But then they wear beautiful plumes and they go back and they're, everybody's admired, they're all admired by the girls. War is, you know, a sort of game. A war is a game back in the Middle Ages compared with what it is in modern times. You look at the battlefields of World War I and World War II. World War I, 14 million people killed. World War II, 66 million people killed. They never did that in the Middle Ages. You got a few dozen people or a few hundred people, maybe a few thousand killed, that was it. They didn't fight, they didn't go to war in Lent, they didn't go to war on Sunday, you know, I mean, they, these things were, it took George Washington to attack across the Delaware on Christmas Day, right? And he counted it a great blow when he attacked. He, it was a smart thing to do to attack on Christmas Day because he won. It was efficient. Or was it such a smart thing to do? as a trade-off, as they say. If you undermine, if you make war bloody, if, you, if you're proud of shooting English soldiers from behind trees, it's simply a matter of time before all the Vietnamese shoot you behind trees. Chickens come home to roost. Uh, so, as for freedom of the press, 16. Freedom of the press is swamping the world in a deluge of error. But, but freedom of the press for Thomas Jefferson was a linchpin of democracy. Well, so Jefferson says, let's have freedom of the press. Lamennais says, well, let's have freedom of the freedom of the press so that we'll have also a Catholic press. And the old Pope says, freedom of the press, forget it. Forget it. <coughs> it's swamping the world in a deluge of error. Look around you today. Look at these vile media that we've got today. Which is no way compensated by the little good that may result. The Pope admits that, but, that, that you may get a little good coming out of um, freedom of the press, but it won't be much. And there's no compensation, there's no way enough to compensate for the terrible error that will result. Instead, the church has publicly burned harmful books. This is the index, this is the inquisition. The church has decreed an index to condemn such books, and it has every right to ex exercise her censorship of them. Do you think there's freedom of the press today? There's no such thing as freedom of the press today. It's just a censorship, but cleverly disguised. The, the poor, dumb people think that they're free. They're nothing of the kind. You're not free to read all kinds of things. And you're not, there's all kinds of things on, on television which are completely censored. If somebody starts talking sense on the television, so he's, he's cut off. And they put back some filthy muck merchant. They've got the, you know, they can, they can shut you up on the, ter on the television. So they, they've got all kinds of censors and intervening buttons, of course. So they, they just shut you up. So there's a strict censorship, there's a strict liberal censorship against any real truth or Catholic thinking in today's media. But it doesn't, it doesn't go by the name of censorship, and it's not called an index, so the poor dumb people think that they're free. They're nothing of the kind. They're being led to the slaughter by the criminal liberals, which is far worse than anything that the church ever imposed upon them by way of censorship. Far worse. The church has publicly burned harmful books. It's decreed an index to condemn such books. The church understands ideas and the importance of ideas. The modern world doesn't. 
Let the authority, then he moves on to liberty of the press, from liberty of the press, he moves on to liberty from authority. Let the authority of princes be guarded. It is of God. So the Catholic Church defends princes, defends authority. Seditious revolutionaries, dethroning princes, are damnable. Dun, 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 dun. Seditious revolutionaries, dethroning princes, are damnable. Well, you know, Washington was partly right to revolt against Henry because Henry had revolted against the Catholic Church. Washington would have been completely right if he'd gone back to the Catholic Church and preserved everything that was good, really good, in the British monarchy and restored what was not good in it by restoring the faith. Then he would have been completely justified. But that's not what he did. He pulled the thing down and threw over the king and threw over the principle of authority and built the United States upon a principle of revolution which has been a destabilizing factor in the United States ever since. Because whenever people go back to the origins of the American Republic in order to strengthen it and solidify it, what do they find? They find a principle of revolution. Therefore, American children naturally revolt against their parents because Washington revolted to make our country. Revolution is, is intrinsic in the whole thing. People today complain about the, f the destruction of the family, but if you glorify revolution, you can't defend the family. You're putting the skids under the family when you glorify revolution. And in the British monarchy, the family was undermined. It's not just the United States. When Henry VIII revolted against God, he was putting the skids again under everything from top to bottom in Great Britain. It's taken a long time for it to work out, but now you've got chaos in Great Britain, uh, just as bad probably as you've got in your... I'd say just as bad, if not worse, than in the United States and in, in the France. So it's, it's not a country problem. I quote the United States, it's simply because this is the country where we are, but it's all over. In anything, not, in everything that's not contrary to religion, Christians have always obeyed. They've always been ready to obey their prince. They've always obeyed their princes, even when Christians were in the large majority. And he quotes the outstanding, outstanding example of St. Maurice, who was the R Roman officer in charge of a whole legion of officers, who could easily have stood up and said, hey, look, you guys, if you want to execute us or make us worship, and, uh, worship false gods, we're going to turn around. We've got 6,000 soldiers, we're going to fight. The legion was decimated. The, the authorities said, you obey, and they said, no, we can't obey because it's against God. Well, in that case, we're going to take every tenth soldier. That's what decimating means. So they took every tenth soldier and killed them. And now you're going to obey? No, we're not going to obey. So they took the second out of every tenth soldiers and killed them. They killed the lot, including St. Morris and the officers. The lot. They would rather be killed than they did not fight. They did not stand up and resist. And they didn't even fire off a lawsuit at the Roman emperor. Because that was not the thinking of Christians. It's, read it. Read about it. If you haven't already read it, read about it. Then go and get an encyclopedia of the saints and, and, and read about St. Morris. What made this man tick? He must have been off his head. Well, the, Pope, the, old, the crusty old bat, Roman bachelor says the saint was in his right mind. Even when Christians were in the large majority. But liberals, in the name of liberty, criminally overthrow authority. And they ardently strive for the separation of church and state. So the separation of church and state, hey, that's a great principle. Crusty old bachelor says, no, separation of church and state is not a good principle. Uh, of course, he's talking about the Catholic church. He's not to, for the state to separate from any false church, yes, of course. But for the state to separate from the Catholic church, no. And here in, even here in the United States, where, where separation of church and state has been a natural principle, you had... Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who's a delinquent if any president ever was, consulting with, guess who? Cardinal Spellman. And the fact that he consulted him is the union of church and state beginning to grow up again. The union of church and state, the union of the Catholic church and the statesman is the most natural thing in the world. You had Reagan consulting with Father de Poor on Long Island, I believe. But president Reagan talked to Father de Poor. He wanted to know what the Catholics were thinking. And a decent Catholic priest will do all that he can to support and back the men who've got that difficult job of exercising authority. 
in, in the suburbs of New York, in, in, the, in, in the wastes of New York, the policemen know that they've got a natural ally in the priest, and the priest, the Catholic priest, will naturally try to help and support the policemen. Because they're, they're working, they've got to be working on, they've got to work together. If they work together, it's a great help to both of them. They both know it. Down on grassroots level, they know that it's a great help. It's natural and it's very helpful. That's the union of church and state. But your liberals say, no, no, no. The state must not be united to the church. The state's got to stay away from the church. The popes don't say so. These liberties are fought for by a host of a, a number of secret societies. So finally the conclusion is, so that those are the Freemasons, noted, the Carbonari, the Alta Vendita, the Masons, and, and so on. But the queen of the, of the, of the secret societies is Freemasonry. We'll, I think we'll do the encyclical on Freemasonry because it's very important to understand the modern world. Um, 28, dear bishops, fight the good fight and let reason defer to faith. Let faith guide men's minds. Dear princes, if you want to defend your kingdoms, this is the secular authorities, defend the faith. Look after the faith, protect the church, and then the church will handsomely help to protect you. Because the church will tell the people to obey their princes. The church will tell you that you've got to stay married until the day you die. You must not fool around with a lot of mistresses. Well, the princes don't like hearing that. They may or may not heed, but... but but the church will tell the princes to obey, and that's why the people will trust the church. And if the people trust the church, well, the church will tell the people to obey. It will tell the princes to do their duty, and tell the people to obey, and you will, have, you will have harmony and order. If everybody listens to the church, you will have harmony and order. Oh no, we don't want union to the church. Well, here, in, even in the dear United States, built on the separation of church and state, still the union naturally starts growing again. Spellman and uh, Roosevelt, Reagan and Father of the Poor, etc. May the Blessed Virgin Mary conquer all her help helpers all, and may the princes of the apostles, that's Peter and Paul, make you like a war. What's Pink Floyd's complaint? The war. But the bishop, the, the Pope wants his bishops to be like a war, a fortress, in order to defend the truth. They've got to stand there without budging, without moving. And they've got to keep the enemy out. With our apostolic blessing, August 15th, 1832. This afternoon, uh, we will look at then at an encyclical on Freemasonry. How many of you have got a text of the encyclical on Freemasonry? Okay. We'll have a look at that because it's very, very clear.